Oh, hello everyone. T- picking up where we lof- left off in our podcast part one, uh, we're looking at other areas where we have lost limitations. Now, both of these uh, rules apply more generally than just vacation homes, but this is a good place as any to bring them up and talk about them. Number one is the at-risk rules, and number two are the passive activity rules. Lost rules, these are pretty complex and have lots of ins and outs, but the basic idea is relatively straightforward. So we'll focus on that basic idea and not on our uh, all the ins and outs of the code. Okay, so basically at risk is you have to lose what, have money in the business to lose it, okay? So whatever you put into the business is what you can actually uh, be at at risk for. That includes any money that that the business borrowed that you would have to pay back if they went bankrupt. So the idea is this is what you're really economically out of pocket in these business cases. And these were were rules that were designed to keep people from... uh, having losses that are greater than the amount of money they actually have invested in the business. So if we contribute 50000 produces a $35,000 loss, you start out with 50000 at risk, but your at-risk amount goes down as you uh, deduct the $35,000 loss. So when you create a second year $20,000 loss, uh, you can't deduct it all because you only have $15,000 at risk. That's what happens, is if you have more losses than you have at risk, then uh, you're not going to be able to use them. You'll have to carry them over uh, to future years, okay? That's, that's the basic at-risk idea. Now, there's also the idea of passive activities. And I have a separate uh, podcast that has some more... Uh, specific definitions on passive activities but basically first you look at at at-risk rules do you have money actually invested in the in the property Uh, once you do know that it's at risk does it fit uh, can it be deducted using the passive activity loss uh, rules okay so to understand them we have to decide that Congress in the tax code decided that all activities are either one of two three things portfolio active or passive so portfolio is pretty easy to identify so really the hard part is is it active or passive and it really isn't to some extent it's the type of activity type of business but it's also more importantly is how much time you spend in the business what is your relationship to the business or to the business activity so if you have material participation then it's active, then you are an active part of the business. And if you don't, you could be passive. So two partners, one could be an active, have material participation in the business, and the other could have be passive and not because they don't have material participation, even though it's the same business, okay? So it's your relationship to that business. So what we're worried about mostly is passive income because the rule says that you can't take losses on passive activities against any of the others. So if you have a loss on passive income, passive activities, that loss will not, allow, will not be deductible against active income or against portfolio income. So where does passive income come from? If you do not materially participate, rental activities by definition are passive except in a very narrow cases and if you're involved in a limited partnership as a limited partner the general partner is not passive but limited partners are okay material participation regular continuous and substantial anything that does not involve rental real estate you're looking solely on the number of hours or how many hours compared to uh, total hours or uh, to, to some arbitrary numbers like 500 hours. And you'll see more of that in the other podcast. 
So it operates not rental real estate, works 600 hours for over 500 hours. That's one of the seven tests uh, to pass be material participate. So this would be active. However, if it is in rental real estate and you want it to not be passive, remember by definition rental real estate is passive, then you have to fit both of these, and this is a much higher test. It's 50% of our personal services and over 750 hours in the year. Okay, so much more stringent than for any other activities because rental real estate is assumed to be passive. So, only business is rental real estate, works 600 hours, now you got a problem because you don't uh, qualify because you have to be over 750. It's a passive activity. Okay. So that's as long as if the passive activity cr creates income, you just pay taxes on the income. This is included in, uh, but it's the issue is how to do, deal with losses. That's really the issue. They can be carried forward. It's not like they go away, but they have to be carried forward. They don't. You can't deduct them in the year that they happened. So. Two passive activities, A and B, one produces income, one loss. You can deduct the loss from one up to the amount of the income from the other. The other 10,000 will have to be carried over. You're not gonna get a deduction for that 10,000 this year. You'll have to wait till future years, okay? Now, I carved out a little exception to this in real estate. So this applies only to rental real estate activities this would be normally passive. We give a little break to people with income that is uh, on the lower end, okay? So to qualify for this special deduction, you have to just actively participate in the rental activity, no, seven, no number of hours or anything, and you have to own at least 10% of the you know, all the interest, which is pretty, that second one's pretty easy. Almost always you're gonna own that. The maximum though on this special deal is only 25,000. And, and it's cut in half for married filings uh, separately who do not live with your spouse and goes away at all if you do live with your spouse during the year. Active participation only means that you have to make management decisions. Decide on who uh, your tenants are going to be, who you're going to hire to fix the plumbing, arranging for others to, 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 to pick up things, whatever. If you are a, if you are managing the rental, you're good for as far as active participation. They really should have come up with a different term for this because it sure sounds like um, an active versus passive, but this is not. This is still a passive activity. It just has active participation. So if she has a rental. This is her only thing, only source of income. Works 600 hours. Okay, she actively participates. She can deduct up to 25000 Okay? But only if her income is um, not over 150000 Okay? Because it phases out uh, over 100000 So let's say assume her modified AGI is one twenty-two. Her $25,000 special deduction, and it literally is called that in the, in the tax law, special deduction. Okay, uh, is modified by the amount, half of the amount that her AGI is over the $100,000 threshold. And that threshold has not changed. It doesn't change every year like some thresholds. It has been $100,000 for as long as I can remember. Okay, so $11,000 reduced. So your special deduction is after the amount is reduced. So you start with 25, uh, subtract out the am amount, the 50% over and then you get, this is your deduction. So even though you had a loss of more, more than that, you have your only, the only amount of loss you can deduct is 14. Okay, this is calculated on form 8582. This is designed to decide how much of your passive activities can actually be used. So notice there's two sections here, active participation, okay, others. All right. They are combined 
Then down here, the bottom is where you take and figure out your income, your AGI, and whether or not you qualify for part of the special deduction up to $25,000. Okay. Notice that even though it's a losses, we always report them as positive numbers. Okay. And then finally, the bottom tells you how much is allowed. Okay. So if you have, see for instance, on this is back to a Schedule E. Notice that the expenses are uh, more than the income by twenty-five thousand. Problem being that because of uh, its passive activity, because there is a limitation on that that comes from the eighty-five eighty-two, then the amount that is actually reported is only nineteen thousand. Okay, so this is in your textbook. So this is your what your loss is prior. This is what your loss is after you look check the eighty five eighty two. So that's what eighty five eighty two is for. Now, what if you have multiple activities and you have different activities that have loss? So if you produce one that's got income, two that produce losses, you can offset the Losses against the income, obviously, you run out of losses. You have more losses than you have income. The $20,000 carries forward to B and C for the next year. Okay, How do you allocate that loss between the two? Well, based on the proportion of the total loss. So if activity B is 45000 out of the 80000 total loss, then it gets 11000 and the other one gets 35 out of 80 or 87.50. Why is that important? Because losses need to be associated with a particular activity because losses on passive activities are deductible in the year that you dispose of the entire activity. So that's why the loss needs to be associated with a particular building or property or activity. So that when you sell that building or property activity, all those suspended losses can be deducted in the year that you sell them. Okay, uh, so that's that's the idea. So those passive activity losses continue to carry over until forever, or until you sell the property that generated those losses. All right.